Happy Sharktoberfest. I'm David McGuire, and I'm here to welcome you to our annual Sharktoberfest celebration of the shark with our Greater Bear Lawns National Marine Sanctuary and Shark Stewards, and all of our partners, nonprofits, and scientists, but especially you, to celebrate sharks and the sanctuary they live in. Shark Stewards was founded in 2006 to reverse the overfishing of sharks, to combat the shark fin trade, and to protect where they live in marine protected areas and sanctuaries like the Greater Farallons. We're part of the Earth Island Institute based in Berkeley, right across from my alma mater, Cal. And we work in education, events like these in schools and universities, but we also apply science to conservation and changing policy through advocacy. I'm a diver, a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences. I'm a National Geographic explorer and an underwater photographer and filmmaker, as well as an ocean explorer. Today, I wanna to talk about California sharks, but also kind of all sharks off of our Pacific coastline and around the world. And a book that I wrote, Sharks for Kids, a junior scientist guide to great whites, hammerheads and other sharks in the sea. This is an 85 pound, 85 page book. It doesn't weigh as much as a young shark. Uh, it's 85 pages geared towards middle schoolers, but really suitable for adults and kids of all ages. And we'll go through some of it, but it has various exercises. It talks about uh, the shark family, taxonomy, how sharks related, the different orders of sharks, what makes a shark a shark, uh, shark behavior, shark biology, and the second part, we really go into the different taxonomy and special orders, including examples of around 30 different kinds of sharks from all around the world, which talks about their biology, uh, where they live, how many babies they have, and sometimes threats. And, and then it concludes with how we can better understand and better protect sharks. So there's the star of our show. Carcharod and Carcharias, which actually from the Latin means shark or rough tooth or serrated. They have these serrated teeth around three rows, 300 that continuously grow and they lose the outer ones and continue to grow them. So sharks don't have to go to the dentist and they feel with their mouth quite often and lose their teeth, which is their one of their toolkits. So it's a good adaptation to continue growing their teeth. White sharks are a large shark. They can get up to some say around 20 feet, 4,000 plus pounds, uh, incredible girth on the large females. As they get older, they get the scarring pattern, as you can see on the shark above the mouth. They have a large black eye that actually is, is very acute. Their vision is excellent. Large fins, especially the pectoral and the dorsal. Uh, large gills, large gills in front of that pectoral fin. They have this beautiful, gray or blue coloration and white underneath, which is called counter shading. And this gives them their name uh, sometimes when they roll over and you see this beautiful white, they call them the white sharks, but they really should be called maybe gray or blue sharks, or how about just magnificent sharks. These sharks do live off of our coastline. They migrate as adults as far west as Hawaii, and they come back and this annual migration to return to our greater Farallon's National Spring Sanctuary, feeding off the pinnipeds of seals and sea lions, uh, sometimes dead whales. And the females tend to go down to Southern California if they're pregnant where they give birth or off the coast of Baja. So we're learning a lot about these fish and their behaviors through remote sensing, through satellite tagging, and sometimes just through direct observation and photography like we do off of our boat, off of the Farallon Islands every Sharktober sometimes mistaken for a white shark in our waters and in the San Francisco Bay are the salmon sharks, which are closely related. They had that same torpedo or fusiform body shape, a large lunate pectoral uh, fin or a caudal tail, that is the tail fin. And then they had these more paddle shaped pectoral fins and a little bit rounder dorsal fin. But the thing that really distinguishes them is that Young white sharks or baby white sharks are around six feet when they're born, five to six feet. 
these guys get up to maybe six, seven, eight feet at their biggest. They're also darker. And sometimes they have this little pink margin from their favorite food, which is salmon. And they migrate north in the summer months all the way up to Alaska, chasing their favorite food, which is fish. We have some of the larger filter, filter feeding sharks. There are only three living now. Uh, the megamouth, which is a deeper shark, the whale shark, which is the largest fish in the sea and is a more tropical shark, and then the basking shark, which does migrate up of our, off of our coastline. And you can see this one here with his mouth open, gulping larval fish, plankton, sometimes unfortunately pieces of plastic. And then those modified gill rakers that you can see catch that plankton like a sieve and then they swallow that. And then other fish like the, the uh, thresher sharks, we have three species of Alopius off of our coastline. This is uh, the common thresher, Alopius fulpinus. We'll see it jumping out of, of the bay quite often. They have this extremely large uh, upper lobe on their caudal fin that they use as kind of a cracking motion and they'll turn, they'll swim at their prey, turn really quick, whip that tail and create a pressure wave or sometimes hit their prey and they come around and eat them. So a highly modified method of fishing. Uh, the star of the San Francisco Bay, it, or at least the largest shark that lives in the bay and we know gives birth in the bay, but also migrates as far north as British Columbia, as far south as Ma Baja. And we know this from direct tagging that was done with the California Academy of Sciences, the seven gill shark, which is a more basal shark in the Hexancaniformidae related to the six gill shark, which also lives in the deeper waters of the bay, but typically more off the continental shelf and deeper water and rarely sees the light of day. Slower moving, they have these big paddle shaped fins, really large eyes with this reflective membrane, much like cats and dogs have to magnify that low light. And then also the six gills that distinguishes them from the other sharks, which have five. And then that more common smaller sharks, the hound sharks, like the leopard sharks, and the unfortunately named soup fin shark or school shark, which were named for their fins, which went into uh, the, the Chinese, Chinese laborers or fishermen that lived in the Bay or came to San Francisco as laborers and lived in areas like China Camp. And, this is a dish of the emperors, but they would they favor this soup and a soup fin shark was one of the favorites. These sharks also live in the San Francisco Bay and our coastal margins, and they also give live birth, they pup in the San Francisco Bay. Their cousins also hound sharks are the brown and gray smooth hound, a smaller shark, three to four feet, uh, very gentle bottom living shark. They eat invertebrates, crabs, dead fish, smaller fish like herring, and they keep the bottom clean. And then there's the swell shark. The swell shark is swell. It's called this because it will gulp water, inflate up. Sometimes it'll grab its tail and wedge itself into a rock or crevice to deter predation from other sharks or sea lions, which like to eat them. They're a smaller shark, three or four feet. Uh, they're very camouflaged, a beautiful, gentle shark. And they're unusual, they also lay egg cases. So many sharks give live birth, like the white sharks. Some sharks have a mixing of their reproductive uh, strategy called oval viviparity, like the white sharks, uh, where they have a, a egg hatched internally and then give live birth. Some sharks just give live birth like mammals and others lay eggs like the swell shark. And sometimes you'll see these little egg cases, they have an embryo in there, and they have this little strand that will hang up in kelp until that embryo gets a chance to uh, digest its egg and chew its way out to become a juvenile swell shark. Another egg layer is the, uh, the horn shark. This is the Pacific horn shark. These live all over the world. Uh, the, the Port Jackson shark looks very much like our Pacific horn shark. Uh, that lives in Sydney Harbor. These guys, sometimes you see them in the San Francisco, Francisco Bay, more, more often in the rocky subtidal habitat off of our coastline. Uh, their family and also their genus is heterodontous, meaning different teeth, because they have a plate and kind of a more pointed tooth to crush shells or crabs and then 
munch them down. These sharks also lay egg cases that are more spiral and the spiral will kind of auger into the sediments. And that, again, that embryo will live on an egg yolk until it's able to uh, get out of this keratin-like egg case and swim away. A deeper sea shark and also a large schooling shark, but surprisingly comes into the San Francisco Bay. And again, we believe to gestate, that is nurture their young internally uh, and give live birth is the dogfish. In this case, this is the Pacific spiny dogfish. And they're called this because they have these two spines right in front of their dorsal fins, which we believe are to deter predation. If a soft mouth animal like a sea lion or a seal bites on it, it might let him go. He might swim away to live another day. And there's an embryo that with that egg case uh, uh, that has been removed by dissection from a dead shark. And that shows the yolk and these sharks have two uteruses and they kind of have this little production line of hundreds of these embryos and eggs that kind of come out until they, the older ones, the more developed ones come out as a free swimming shark. And then the unlikely weird looking flat angel shark, which also lives in the sediments off of our coastline, uh, Squatina californica. So she, we have our own genus of angel sharks. They live all over the world. Uh, the ones in the Mediterranean are almost extinct. They're extremely rare, including off our coastline. When I was growing up, we used to see these off the coastline of uh, LA and Santa Barbara, but there was a large commercial fishery including one off Bodega Bay, it's now closed and this is a protected shark because they have not yet recovered. They live in the sediments, sometimes with them, they can ambush uh, a, a method called ambush predation where they spring off their tail and uh, they blend into, into their sediments or sometimes are buried in there until a fish comes by, but they also are nocturnal and forage at night and have uh, omnivorous diet. And they have these little barbels on their nose as many sh sharks like nurse sharks do to kind of feel the sediments that might feel invertebrates or uh, animals like a crab swimming by. And then they have a large mouth that actually can suck that prey in. And then you have this sort of transitional form uh, that actually the angel sharks look a little bit more like a ray. They're flat and they have wing-like pectoral fins. This is a uh, spiny, I mean, a uh, uh, shovel nose guitar fish. There are two species in the bay. They have this sort of shovel nose. They look kind of like a guitar, uh, but they're, they're also their pectoral fins are, are fused, but they are not a shark. They are, are actually in the ray family and they live in, in the, the sediments also, the muds and the sands, and they forage nocturnally as well. This is the thornback guitar fish, which is in the guitar fish group, but they look a lot more like uh, what we think of as a stingray. And then of course the bat ray, which is the smiley popular ray that swims along. Divers love to see them. They're beautiful. They literally fly in the water. They are a mobile array. They are related to eagle rays and manta rays, the giant ray that lives in the tropics, but they live on the bottom and they have these plate-like teeth that also grind shells and uh, happily swimming along. And they'll actually use those wings to stir up and even create holes in the bottom to uncover their prey. So when I've been diving, I see these big holes and you know that there are bat rays around foraging. And then we have other rays like the round stingray uh, that also has a little stinger, a little barb on its tail, as does the bat ray and other rays. That's a protective mechanism. Sometimes people step on these unwittingly and that, that spine will whip up with the tail and actually stab a person. And it's also a very pen, painful, venomous sting. The cure for that is to put hot water on it. We see these down in Southern California, particularly down an area that we call Ray Bay off of Seal Beach, where there are hundreds of these and there are also hundreds of people get stung each year, but it's also the uh, location of a nursery for many young white sharks who love to forage on these rays. And sometimes you'll see the stingers embedded in the sharks uh, mandibles around their jaws. So young white sharks, when they're born off of our coastline, typically in Southern California, 
forage on fish and they love to eat stingrays. And then the torpedo ray, which also lives off of the central California coastline and south, uh, is actually an electric ray. It creates this current between its two uh, pectoral fins and it will create a shock that can stun a fish or other prey and then they will consume them. If people get this shock, in some cases, not ours, it might be 20 volts, which is quite a, quite a jolt, but in some cases with the larger torpedo rays, it can be a couple hundred volts, which actually could give somebody a heart attack, could be fatal. So respect them and respect all these sharks and rays because they're amazing. As you can see, how different they all are. And yet these are all in the larger elasmobranch or shark family. And then you have the big skate, which is the biggest skate, which is a kind of related to the rays, but they are not in the, the ray uh, order. And they, but they are also benthic. They live a very similar lifestyle. Uh, they flap their wings. Uh, in this case, the, the giant or the big skate can go down thousands of feet. They lay a, the largest egg case that we know, as big as a person's hand. Sometimes they have as many as four or five embryo inside that case, which is unusual. Usually it's one embryo per case. And again, these uh, embryo mates will nurture off of that yolk until they're ready to uh, chew their way out of that keratin purse and swim away. So these are really interesting kinds of flat sharks, we call them. And then, of course, the star of Sharktoberfest and of our coastline during what we call Sharktober, the summer months, bounded around uh, late August and then all the way into the fall, uh, early fall, November, late fall, that is November. And we call these events Sharktober because this is when these big sharks, sometimes the pregnant white shark females like this, come back from their migration to either forage or to give birth. And that's when we see a lot more off our coastline and coincidentally, uh, non-coincidentally that is, they, you see more interactions, more bumps, more investigations with, uh, when people are out either swimming or paddle boarding or flying drones. Why do we call it Sharktober? Well, thanks to some of the work done by the Monterey Aquarium and Stanford's uh, top lab uh, with Barbara Block and her graduate students, we see these sharks migrate west. If you look in the middle by May, June, they're in this area that's been termed the White Shark Cafe, where through recent research, we're seeing they're doing this incredible diving program uh, uh, profiles over a thousand feet deep. Uh, in some cases we think, it, or scientists think it's been displaying like maybe for a female, but these sharks are so spread apart, even out there, it may be they're hunting on giant squid. It's possible they're all also breeding out there. The gestation of a white shark is around a year, possibly a little bit longer. So that's why the females will separate out from the males uh, if they come back pregnant. So if you look at this slide over here, January, uh, they're already on their migration. They're all the way out in the Pacific by May, June, they're completely gone. And by late summer and uh, September, they start to return to the, our coastline and these rookeries or breeding areas like the Farallons, like Point Reyes, like uh, uh, Año Nuevo, but also farther south like Guadalupe Island and in the Sea of Cortez. And then they start to do that migration west again in the colder, winter months, November, really December, January. So if you look at this next profile, that's probably about early winter. So these yellow are sea surface temperature uh, data points when the shark gets near the surface. This is from a satellite tag that's been placed on its back. There's also an acoustic tag here at the Farallons. And the red ones are where the tags fall off. And if you're lucky, they fall off near shore so you can get them and get the rest of the data. And if you're not lucky, you have to get out in a boat or hopefully somebody can find that as far west as Hawaii. But what we're seeing is this incredible migration of these large sharks, the adults, each year, which takes an incredible amount of energy, if you can imagine, swimming 100 miles a day for weeks or months at a time. 
we're also learning some really interesting behavior and facts about the young sharks that live off our coastline. And most of this work has been done by Chris Lowe down at Cal State Long Beach. And this study was just published that shows this movement of young sharks north of Point Conception. Historically, we rarely saw young sharks, uh, young white sharks off of Central California and Northern California. But in 2015, there was this marine heat wave, we called it the blob in the North Central Pacific. Uh, it maintained these higher sea surface temperatures. And what that did is it gave an avenue for these young sharks, which prefer a temperature range between maybe 55 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere peaking around 78, 76, 70 preferentially. It gave them the ability to move up because they have less mass, less volume, and they get colder. Typically they would stay down in the Southern California Bight where they're born. We see them off of all of these coastlines, Santa Monica Bay, San Diego, off the sandy beaches of LA, foraging on fish. But uh, in 2015, 2016, we started to see these young sharks and uh, sub-adults off of Capitola where there was an aggregation of, but also there's now one off of Monterey, uh, also Santa Barbara seeing larger sharks than historically what we've seen in these aggregations of young sharks. So this is a result of climate change, we believe, of and these anomalous sea temperatures, which are having a distribution of this cohort or this age group of sharks distributing along their coastline, as well as we're seeing the population recover because they are protected. I think it's cool. Most surfers are fascinated by it. And we have not seen an uptick in white shark uh, bites on humans, fortunately. Why are sharks cool? Why do we celebrate sharks? Well, in this tropical example, we see the hammerhead, like the white shark, like the mako shark, at the top of the food chain. They are the regulator. They maintain the health and the balance of the population below them. They eat the sick, the stupid, and the slow, and they leave behind the quick, the smart, and the healthy. Sharks are also really important for maintaining this intact trophic level. So if you remove the roof of the house, the walls fall in. Uh, you relieve that regulatory pressure off the secondary or tertiary predators. They in turn eat the next level, which also allows in a proliferation of the species underneath, which in the case of a coral reef might be, uh, there are no more uh, species that eat the algivores, the ones that eat algae off coral, or sometimes a lot of proliferation of lionfish. Uh, so there's not a balance in this system and it creates uh, an unhealthier system that has less diversity and has less abundance. And that, that, that analogy also works off of our coastline in the case of the mesopredators, predators, which are marine mammals. Uh, in the case of California sea lions, they have almost expanded beyond the carrying capacity and they're getting diseased, they're starving. So we need more sharks to take care of our little furry marine mammal friends in a biological sense. Uh, sharks are threatened with extinction globally. Around one third of open ocean sharks are threatened with extinction. The numbers are staggering, between 70 and 100 million sharks killed for their fins alone, for the shark fin trade. Uh, but we're also over harvesting sharks through bycatch accidentally or, or uh, not intentionally for swordfish or tuna, but we kill tens of millions of blue sharks, mako sharks. They're disappearing from the seas and because we don't care so much about sharks as we care about sea turtles or we care about marine mammals like seals or on the land, polar bears or even panda bears. Uh, we love them less and we don't want to protect them as much, but they're every bit as important, in some cases even more important. Other threats such as climate change, habitat loss are also creating an impact. One study shows that almost 77% of the shark biomass, shark and ray populations overall have been reduced since we began industrial fishing. We're fishing them too hard. And in many cases, we're not even eating them or discarding them for the, the body for their fins, or we use them for fish food or just discard them as bycatch. It's why we need large protected areas like our marine national monuments like our national marine sanctuary. So people are not commercial fishing that we, these animals have an area of sanctuary. 
an area that's protected. And the goals globally are to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. We have a long way to go. We're at about seven and a half percent protected globally under these networks of internationally protected areas or in national waters. In one case, the Antarctic, uh, the Papahanaumokuakea, which are the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, Marine National Monument, our largest, um, but it's not enough. And these animals need more room, especially long ranging, uh, far swimming animals like white sharks. They swim east to west. There are no protected areas on the open seas. There are no migratory, no take zones. And these animals that we love, that we protect, are trying to protect here in California are getting killed on long lines as bycatch, caught in gillnets, even off of California until we can phase out the gillnet fishery we're losing these sharks. And it's 90%, 98% of the habitable space on earth is our ocean. We should really call it planet ocean. So we can do a lot more to protect our ocean that takes care of us through all of these ecosystem services, through climate, through oxygen, through food, through recreation, through transport. We need our oceans. So we need to work harder to protect more of them from overfishing and these other impacts that are affecting not just sharks, but marine mammals, sea turtles, and even plankton. So we're working on increased protection in the San Francisco Bay and near shore waters. Uh, we have a project that it's a community science that you can participate in. Uh, we're gleaning data through social media, through direct observations called Shark Watch California. And we have come up with a QR code. There's an app. We're, we're trying to look at the impact on recreational fishermen that are killing pregnant seven gill sharks in the San Francisco Bay where they come to give birth. This sharks had maybe 80 newborns ready to be born or 80, 80 uh, babies ready to be born uh, for sport primarily, not even for food or young white sharks that have been caught more than once damaging their gills and tiring them out. These are protected species, but they're being fished for sport. We're also trying to get a grip on sometimes range uh, a shift in species range through climate change. So we're looking at for data and participation through this citizen science program. And you can go to sharksewards.org and learn more about the Shark Watch program. But also we're working in our California marine protected areas. Uh, I co-chair what's called the Golden Gate MPA Collaborative Network. We work with the state of uh, California Fisheries uh, Department, the Fish and Wildlife Department, the Ocean Protection Council, and the California Academy of Sciences, collecting data underwater, sometimes subtitly, to better understand our MPAs, but also to communicate how this network of state waters inside that three mile zone or around the islands uh, are benefiting marine life. So in some areas like the North Farallons and around Southeast Farallons where I showed these pictures, these are no take zones. You cannot fish in these areas at all commercially or recreationally. The white, the blue areas is a, is a conservation area. Uh, it's a state marine conservation area that you can pull fish for some species. So this network of MPAs, marine protected areas, goes from the Oregon border to the Mexican border. There are 124, including special closures for birds and marine mammals. And ultimately, we hope to bring some of these to protect habitat like eelgrass, uh, nursery areas for leopard sharks and bat rays and nursery areas for seven gill sharks to create no fishing zones and habitat protection in the San Francisco Bay. Each Sharktober, I lead trips out, uh, university classes, but also public trips to our National Marine Sanctuary, to the Farallon Islands. We educate, we look at wildlife, we count whales, we make observations. Sometimes we see great white sharks and add to the database through photo ID to determine what individuals have returned, perhaps new ones, look at behavior among marine mammals, look at for rare species, and really have an incredible experience, a uh, day-long trip out to the Farallons. And you can join us on one of them this Sharktober. Go to our website and find out how you can join us. And you can join us by volunteering. Uh, we're a big network, the, the Fanks Sanctuary, Association needs your help. Uh, we're nonprofits too. We need your donations. We need your time. Most of all, we need your love to protect sharks and the sanctuary that we love. So thanks for joining us for Sharktoberfest and 
and, and please support all your partners, at, uh, all of our nonprofit partners, all of the participants at Sharktoberfest, all of the people who are working uh, to learn more and to share uh, the knowledge around our coastline and marine animals and how to maintain and protect them in perpetuity. You can order Sharks for Kids online uh, at sharkstewards.org and that will help support shark stewards as well. And I'll sign it and give you a sticker. Thanks to our sponsors, especially the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary for supporting Sharktoberfest year after year. NOAA, of course, uh, our, our funders, the California Academy of Sciences and our grant, granting agencies, but also the Earth Island Institute, which is our foundation where Shark Stewards lives across from the Berkeley campus. Thanks for watching. Please join us next Sharktoberfest, uh, but also help us celebrate and protect sharks year round, day after day, celebrating sharks, celebrating where they live and protecting our San Francisco Bay, our Pacific Ocean and our world ocean. So thank you again for listening. I'm David McGuire with Sharktoberfest signing off. Enjoy the rest of the program.